Um, baie welkom, dit is wonderlijk om so'n goeie opkomst te sien. Dankie um, vir al en Hanley wat vir ons die voordrag gaan gee. Um, Dr. Hanley Adendorf is een van ons adviseers by Centrum van Onrig en Leer en uh, achtergrond is eindelijk in chemie. She has a PhD in chemistry but now in her role as an advisor specif- specifically in um, research in teaching and learning um, she's been serving widely at the university but also quite a bit in the Faculty of Science and it's nice to see some of the colleagues from that, that faculty supporting today. Um, her focus is really on developing research in teaching and learning amongst the other colleagues. And I think that's so important for us to make sure that there is no division between what we do as practicing teachers but as we research how to do that better. And um, her talk um, today will also show us how she's made a transition from being a researcher in science, her original vocation, into research, how do we actually offer sciences. So, Annie, bye, thank you. We see you out your onderwerp. She has a very interesting and very relevant topic today, and that is about um, how do we go about the decolonization of the science curricula in particular. So thank you, Anneli. We're looking forward to your presentation. And then afterwards, we can have a bit of a discussion. Thanks for preparing and thanks for presenting. We're looking forward to it. Bye, thank you. Thank you to Professor Schoenwinkel. Welcome to all of you who are here this afternoon. I had a moment to look over the audience and to see how scary you are looking. Um, <laughs> I, I might just be able to relax yet. Just a disclaimer or two as I'm getting started, and the first and most important one is that I don't have answers, and I think it would have been rather audacious to stand up here and say I have answers, um, or for anybody at this point in time to do that. I think we are still trying to explore what this is about, figuring out what's going on and where it might take us and head, where, where we might head with it. So. This talk is more about me and co-author Mike Blackie that is sitting there trying to make sense of what the calls for decolonization in science are and how science ought to respond. Is there a way? Can it be decolonized, etc.? I'm not a decolonization scholar at all, um, so there will be lots of literature in that field that I'm not familiar with. You are welcome to test me on it later on. I will fail, I can tell you beforehand. I'm passionate about science, that's where I'm starting, about science education. Um, I'm no longer really a scientist either, although I learn more and more every day that we can't escape our training as scientists. It's deeply rooted, and you'll see me talking about that as I'm proceeding with this presentation. And when I, once I looked through it this morning, I felt that the topic from talk to talk um, might be misleading in itself. Maybe it's actually from talk to talk, from talk to talk rather than the other way around that it should have been. Because to us, when we did this work, it was about opening up a conversation, figuring out how we can start conversing about decolonization rather than figuring out how to head forward. I think we've made some progress, and I might refer to that towards the end. So what's the backdrop of decolonization and calls for decolonization, just to contextualize, to put us in the picture a little bit for those of you, like me when I started with this, that might not have read all the work. Um, Leslie Lagrange from Stellenbosch University argues that in transformation of higher education, we have failed to pay attention to transformation of the curriculum. So we've looked at all the managerial stuff, mergers, governance, incorporations, but the curriculum has lagged behind. That's one of our starting points. Hilata says that um, most of what happens at universities in South Africa is still rooted in colonial apartheid and Western worldviews and those epistemological traditions. Adding on to that, or prior to that, Ramupi argues that what we do at universities is disconnected from African realities and does not include or excludes the lived experience of the majority of South Africans, and thus the majority of students. And this is universities in South Africa across the board that they're talking about, not a specific university. Prior to all of that, Césaire argued that decolonization is about the consciousness and the rejection of values, norms, customs, and worldviews imposed by former colonizers. Mbembe, however, gives a nuanced 
opinion on this and says that it's not about closing the door to European and other traditions, but it's rather about defining clearly what the centre is and that the centre in Africa should be Africa. So that's the backdrop, and where does that leave us as science? How do we move forward with this? What, um, what are these epistemological traditions, for example, that they are talking about? Our entry, mine specifically, and Max Blackie, because I dragged her into it, um, she might have been in it earlier than that, uh, was through the Science Must Fall video clip, ironically. It's late, uh, if you allow me to tell a story, late in 2016, I was preparing an abstract for a conference in Australia. And while preparing the abstract, this video clip popped up in YouTube somewhere. Out of curiosity, I watched. It's just four minutes long. Um, just out of interest, how many of you have seen it? Okay, so that's by far the most. A few haven't. I'll expand on it a little bit. My whole talk won't be about it, but I think it gives us a good entry for the argument I'm going to try to make. Um, so my first response as I'm watching this young girl saying that we should kick out Newton and start from scratch with science is one which is not atypical for scientists. It's what? Does she even know what she is saying? And then I walked away and I came back with a different response. The second time I looked at it, at least I did look a second time, and a third and a fourth and a tenth and a twentieth later on as I did the research, the second time I looked at it, another idea popped into my mind. I have a theory that can explain this. And hence was born another abstract for the LCT conference in Australia last year, and this is where that journey started. The, in this clip, the young girl makes statements such as, um, maybe just to put it in context first, the clip is a four-minute excerpt from a two-hour conversation about decolonizing science specifically that was held at UCT. Um, ironically and sadly, only four minutes of it was clipped out. One can find the full clip, but you have to spend a lot more time to find it. She argues, or makes the points, that Western modernity is a direct antagonistic factor to decolonizing, and she calls it totalizing. She also argues that we need to start science from an African perspective, having knowledge that is produced by us, that speaks to us, and that is able to accommodate knowledge from our perspective. What I want to do next is just show that these points that she, these words that fall strangely on the ears especially of scientists, are not completely new, that it, and there has been precedent for some of these in history before, maybe put in a slightly different context. So here's the first one. She talks about Western modernity as the direct antagonistic factor to decolonization. And Leach and Fair had in 2002 in a paper that looked at indigenous knowledge systems, what they call Western science, and um, citizen science makes the argument that Western science, in its modernist case, there are the words, stands in an ambiguous relationship with indigenous knowledge systems or indigenous ways of knowing, doing, and being. She also says the following, how do you even begin to decolonize science? Her argument here is that whenever we put forward the idea of decolonizing science, this is the response of scientists. How do you even begin to decolonize science? Because science is true, because it is science. In 1972, Thomas, in the beautiful book Counter Course, says the following about mathematics, thus the concept is there because, because it is there because it is there. Um, they're not the same, but a similarity. We can start to get the same kind of feel happening here. Hilata says that reliance on Western knowledge about Africa, and I think this summarizes part of what this is really about, is an old colonial and imperial notion. The idea that natives can only be informants and not intellectuals. And I think on this hinge, a lot of what decolonization calls are about, and where we in science have to think really carefully about how we respond to it. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to use four different constructs. You ha don't have to read that one up there. I just want to run through them, and then I'll take them one by one. The first is the epistemic pedagogic device, which is called Maiton's extension of Bernstein's earlier work. Um, and I'll get to that in a moment. Then from LCT, legitimation code theory, which is a theory interested in the underpinning or implicit rules of the game in different knowledge practices, about surfacing that, about us understanding what's going on underneath the surface. And from LCT, I will use specialization. Specialization is interested in what makes a claim a legitimate claim and who can make a legitimate claim in a field. So how do we decide what and who is legitimate um, as claims and as participants? 
And then I will use autonomy, who is interested a little bit more in power, but specifically in terms of what is inside our practices, what are we using, and to what ends are we using it. And then I'll refer briefly to the idea of gazes, which is the stances with which we position ourselves in these different fields. Starting with this one, the argument here is that when we look at higher education, we need to look at three different spheres or fields, let's call it that rather, and let's take science as an example here. So there's the field of production, which is really research in science. That's where knowledge is made. That's our labs and sitting with mathematical proofs, etc., where we produce new knowledge. But then before we can teach students that knowledge, it has to be recontextualized into a curriculum. So we have to choose what to put in and what not to put in and what sequence, etc. That's the field of recontextualization. That's the field where the curriculum is decided. And then there is the field of reproduction, which is a rather odd name for it, but that's where we take it into pedagogy. We take it into our classrooms and we give try to give students access to that knowledge in the curriculum. When people talk about decolonizing science, it's sometimes hard to see which one of the fields they're referring to. It sounds as if in the science must fall video clip they're talking about the field of production because they're calling it science. But I'm assuming they're really talking about the field of recontextualization and, and the field of pedagogy or reproduction. So that's what I'm going to focus on today, and I'm just going to conflate the two for the purposes of this presentation. I'm going to use a few data sources, three to be specific. The first one is this conversation that erupted rather emotively in social media after the release of the Science Must Fall video clip. And I'll look at some of what was said in the video clip. I'll look at the responses of Shlabangani Mchali, if I've got, I've got his name correct, who um, put an opinion piece in the conversation. And then I'll look at what Professor Tim Crow was previously associated with UCT said about it. And then I will look at, and this I will do just as a, a very broad and almost caricatured example of what we're trying to put forward. Then I will look at um, free curricula, decolonized engineering curricula, put forward by Chris and Simon Winberg last year at the IEEE conference. And if time allows, I'll touch on some of the things that happened in the FIG, which is interested in the decolonization of the STEM curriculum here at Stellenbosch University. Starting with specialization. Specialization, we said, is about legitimacy, legitimate knowledge claims, and legitimate knowers. And it starts from the premise that every, any knowledge claim is made by someone about something. That sets up two relations. And a, a relation to knowledge, which is the something, and a relation to knowers, which is the someone. And both these relations can vary from weaker to stronger. So you can have weaker knowledge or epistemic relations about knowledge or stronger ones, etc. And we can do something which we as scientists like. We can plot it on a plane, um, which gives us four quadrants or four specialization codes. I'm running over it very, very quickly because I really want to get to the results rather to what legitimation code theory is. So when we plot these two from weaker social relations to stronger and weaker epistemic relations to stronger epistemic relations. What we have at the top here, we've got a field in which knowledge is very important, in which it is all about the knowledge, the specialized knowledge that I bring to the table. When I'm here on the right hand side of the quadrant, it is all about the knower attributes that I'm bringing to the table, or that's more important than the knowledge, let's put it that way. So in the four quadrants, this quadrant, weak social relations, strong epistemic relations, we have the so-called knowledge code, and that is the code in which knowledge is more important than knowers. Knowers are subservient to knowledge. Knowers builds knowledge. Sounds familiar to the people on this side of the table? Then this side of, we have something which is very unfamiliar to all of us as scientists. This is where knowers and their attributes and their dispositions are more important than the knowledge. The knowledge becomes subservient and is used to build a hierarchy of knowers in knower code fields. Not sounding familiar, I hope, to science. And then we get a field in which both are important and we get a quadrant in which neither is important. So anything goes, really, and we're not going to focus on that one as you could have imagined. Okay, so in order to bring this theory to bear on the data that we have, we have to put together some translation devices. So we have to look at what we will be looking for in literature, what it will manifest as in literature, so, or in, in our data at least. Epistemic relation, relations, we decided, is any place in which people are referring to the explanatory power of science and the processes, or the scientific process. 
So when someone's putting emphasis on that, we're going to code it as stronger epistemic relations. When someone downplays that, we're going to co code it as weaker epistemic relations. So to the left-hand side or to the right-hand side or bottom or wherever on that um, set of quadrants of ours, you'll hopefully remember better than me standing up here. Giving you two examples, Tim Crow at the top, um, he speaks about um, the conversation that has published an article promoting the decolonization of mathematics, and then he says, arguably the purest of the sciences. He's emphasizing science, mathematics, as the purest of sciences. In the, decolonize, in the Science Must Fall video clip, the young girl is saying that decolonizing science would mean doing away with it entirely and starting all over again to deal with how we respond to environments and how we understand it. So it's downplaying the importance of science, scientific process, and scientific theory. So we can just restart it. All right. Social relations would be where there's a reference to personal experience and knowledge. This is emphasized in the Science Must Fall video clip when she says knowledge that is able to accommodate knowledge from our perspective, the personal. Don played by Tim Crow um, in quite harsh words when he talks about a f uh, the video indicates a fullest decolonized view within which beliefs are the rule. So Don playing that all together, the social. Beliefs are the rule and the new Afrocentric science acts merely as a confirmatory tool to help the re-educated and decolonized minded to reinforce beliefs. Um, so that's Don playing the social. He's arguing that um, that's not the way to go. An interesting case to me was this paper, or this opinion piece, really, how you probably misunderstood science must fall. Um, I mentioned to him earlier, Charlie, and he, I'm going to just take two things that he says from his paper. The first one is this, he explains science as follow. Science is a system of human, humans trying to explain and prove and predict natural occurring phenomena. It's not necessarily, we won't necessarily all agree, but this is emphasizing science as explanatory, science as making predictions, science as we know it. And then he says... Science, which is basically the theory of heroic invention and discovery, which gives props to one dude for observing and noting down something. Science, see, example, Isaac Neutron, and, um, and not multiple discovery. So that now he's emphasizing the social, the dudes who participate in science. So taking all this onto our set of quadrants, I would argue that science must fall. Of course, I've looked at more than just these few quotes mostly operates in this quadrant as a knower code. So here who I am and the attributes I'm bringing to the table, the dispositions is more important than the knowledge. And hence the argument that we can just throw out science and restart it. Coming from her worldview, her perspective, that's not an unreasonable claim. Tim Crow operates clearly in what's familiar to us as science, um, and I don't need to go into depth on that. And Shlabangani Mchali sits somewhere in between. And I would argue that he's closer to the elite code. And in that way, in his um, piece in the conversation, already starts to play a bit of a mediating role between these, that's his attempt, between these different conversations playing out. Okay, so this then brings us to our first conclusion from the data. And that is that what we have here really is a code clash. These two people are speaking different languages. Now, this is not new, and this is not only typical to this conversation. It's actually quite old, and it has been around since the late 50s, early 60s, when the two cultures debate broke out, and the argument there was that these scientists and, yeah, and people from humanities were speaking different languages. Maiden argues that it's m about more than just the languages. It's about the underlying structuring principles of the languages. And his argument is, if you look at the graph, that science has a hierarchical knowledge structure. We focus on theories. And we focus on theories that can explain more and more and more phenomena. So we try and get as many phenomena at the bottom here into a single explanatory theory. We have a horizontal structure of knowers, however. So we don't have a knower hierarchy. It's about whether you have the knowledge and can use it uh, properly, rather than your dispositions and who you are. The exact opposite happens in humanities and social sciences. Of course, this is a very broad st strokes application and doesn't happen and doesn't apply in every specific subfield. But broadly speaking, we've got a hierarchical structure of knowers. So it's the knowers that are hierarchically organized, while knowledge with multiple theories sit seated one next to the other, so a more horizontal knowledge structure. So knowledge there, I can discard one theory and bring in another theory to look at the same kind of thing. It's a totally different, it, it's not as 
Well, it's strange to ask that coming from that perspective as it is to ask us to throw out Newton altogether in science. Okay, so to summarize this, um, in humanities, knowledge itself mattered less in the position of procedures, and we can make that present tense too. Uh, procedures and skills was relatively unimportant in Merton's study. Instead, the basis of specialization, of legitimacy, was possessing the right kind of dispositions or character. As opposed to that, and science, what matters is what you know, not who you are. And here specific things were mentioned in his study, and he quotes from other people here, the sense of loyalty to an abstraction called knowledge, I thought that was beautiful, commitment to truth, allegiance to their discipline, um, etc., which specialized identity and scientific fields. So what we see, this is starting to paint a picture of what science is and how science operates already and why scientists react so strongly to calls to throw out that on which science is based, because in effect it would mean doing away with what we know as science, with the way that science lives and does and makes knowledge. Okay, then a brief look at gazes, the stances that we bring to these fields, and going from stronger to weaker social relations. In science, we said, this side, to have a trained gaze, we train people into using our theories, our knowledge, and our process in the correct way, right? The cultivated gaze right next to that, stronger social relations, that's what, what we find in humanities and in social sciences, and that is something that is acquired through a longer period of enculturation, of immersion, um, so as to create the correct kind of character or disposition or the right type of knower. The social gaze is an interesting one. This gaze you have as a result of the social category or social status. So I'm a woman. That could be a social gaze. I'm a black woman. I'm a black person. So social gazes are related to my social category. And the born gaze would be something like she's born with an ear for music. How are knowers built in these different fields? And science, we remember the knower structure is horizontal, so we're not going to talk about that. And the cultivated gaze of humanities and social sciences, knowers are built by adding new knowers at the bottom of the triangle and enculturating them into the way of doing and being. Right, so we build by expanding the bottom of the triangle and these people are then um, cultivated into the ways of thinking. And the social gaze, that cannot really happen because I can only participate, if a, if a specific social gaze is the basis for participation in a field, I can only participate if I have that gaze. If it is about me being a woman, only women can participate. If it's about me being an Afrikaans-speaking woman, how do we build knowers? We don't. We fracture. Because then we have a group of Afrikaans-speaking women, English-speaking women, old women, young women. This is um, not, not theoretical or literature-based at all, but you get the picture. So we fracture by bringing in different gazes. What's the problem that we're seeing here? It seems as if the goal in Science Must Fall video clip are calling for a specific social gaze as the requirement for legitimate participation in the kind of science that she is putting forward, which is it's miles removed from science's trained gaze, which really says, and Snow said that in 1959 already, that the only true one culture is science, where the argument from science normally is it's open to anybody. We don't, we don't predict or we don't exclude on the basis of what social gaze you bring into it. Okay, then moving on to autonomy. Okay, and autonomy, it is about, um, we again have two positions, and the positions are about, I said earlier, um, or two relations about what is inside, what we use, and what ends we're using it towards. So positional autonomy is about relations between the things the actors, the ideas, the objects, the theories, the practices, etc., inside a curriculum or inside our classroom, and its relationship with the positions from outside that. Relational autonomy is about the ways these thing are, things are arranged inside as opposed to outside, and it will make more sense when I show it to you in a translation device in a moment. But again, as in specialization, these two can vary in strength, and we can get a plane with four quadrants or four codes. The names of these codes are beautifully, beautiful explanatory. The first is the sovereign code, when we have strong positional autonomy and strong relational autonomy. This is where we're using things from inside science to advance science. Purposes advancing science, the stuff comes from inside science. Sovereign code. So um, that I don't need to explain anything more of. The Roman code is 
um, dancing, everybody dancing to the tune of Rome. It's based on the idea that in the Roman Empire, they brought in lots of things from everywhere and they made it subservient to their culture, to what they were doing. So here the same, this is where we bring in things from outside science into science for the purpose of advancing science, whatever it might be. I can think, we can easily think of how it plays out in our disciplines, bringing in mathematics into physics to make physics explain certain things and do certain things. You'll see in a little while, it's harder to think of where we do it in science, in our curricula and our pedagogy, than it is to think of it in specific disciplines. If we go to the Trojan Code, this is where we use things from inside to outside purposes. So now we're using the science in our curriculum classes to do something that is not science. And then there's the exotic code, which is things from elsewhere for elsewhere purposes. And again, we're going to ignore that one. So in our case, positional autonomy will be um, the things inside science, the ideas, the theories, the objects from inside science will be strong positional autonomy, and things from outside will be weak positional autonomy. And where the purpose of the curriculum or the pedagogy is to advance science, that will be strong relational autonomy. And where the purpose is to advance something other than science, the purpose will be, uh, the code will be weak relational autonomy. Okay, so let's see if we can make this sense for, make it make sense for a little bit of what we know about science. What would be an example of something in the Trojan Quadrant? It would be elements um, of a curriculum, for example, aimed at um, achieving graduate attributes. That is, if that really, it really is the purpose. It's not when we slap on graduate attributes, it's something we hope would achieve, be achieved. And I can think of one example in science <laughs> at the moment that really tries to do that, and that is the Science in Context module, which was presented last year at the CERTL conference, where they are using content from inside science, new developments, new things happening to help students develop, this is in pedagogy really, but also in the curriculum, it's structured that way, to develop specific skills. Here I chose graduate attributes. Where do we see the Roman quadrant in science and curricula? Not that often. Um, you might have more examples. This was one example we could think of. Some of our curricula includes modules from outside. Very few, very few and far between. We are talking about um, curricula that would be progressive than that, but this is where we are at the moment. This is here, I pulled it apart, and I'm first just looking at curriculum. So this is just looking at curriculum. It's not yet looking at what's happening in the class, looking at what's happening inside our classes. Again, most of our science teaching would be sitting in the top right hand side sovereign quadrant, science context for, content for advancing science. Science in, uh, sign, the course I just mentioned for first years, um, science in context, specifically aiming at achieving certain skills in students, teamwork skills, literacy skills, etc. Skill, word skills in itself is often debated, but you get the picture. This is where we are using science, a science course in science context to teach students how to write, to teach students how to do group work, um, etc. All right. And then on the other side of it, in our classes quite often we use real world examples by which to explain our scientific theory. The purpose is still advancing science, but the example comes from outside science. I come from chemistry, as Professor Skonwinkel said, chemistry textbooks in my time almost always had an example of the effect of acid rain on marble statues. I chose that one specifically because we don't have a lot of that here to look at that's been standing there for hundreds of years. So already something that is not familiar to the students reading these textbooks. All right, so now looking at how we typically respond to calls for decolonization. So our typical responses are in the fields of recontextualization and fields of pedagogy are the following. In recontextualization, some of the things that we might do, and now I have to make it very clear, so I'm not going to make a value judgment on it. I just want to show you what legitimation code theory says could be happening in some of these cases. An example that, quite a beautiful example. So we're doing microbiology and we're talking about whatever that would be that you're talking about at that point in time, those of you who know microbiology. We might decide to bring in someone from who can explain something like traditional beer making. In other words, bring in content from the indigenous knowledge community or environment, indigenous knowledge systems into our class to, and using that to try and make it more familiar to students to help them understand the microbiological principles. Right? Sound familiar? We do those kinds of things. Beautiful example, but there's a risk here. And that risk is that we're making indigenous knowledge systems dance to the tune of science, aren't we? 
That is really how Maitin describes the Roman quadrants. It's learning to dance to the tune of Rome. And in that itself sits the risk that it could be seen as profaning knowledge which is not ours, not sciences, to advance the purpose of science, which people have not necessarily bought into or understood. So there in the risk, I'm not saying it can't be done, and I'm not saying it's wrong to be done, but it might depend on who's doing it. I want to look at another example, um, which actually sits across both those quadrants. Also microbiology, third year microbiology. This is Karen Jacobs. Her first third year students do a project. Um, they run it from beginning to end instead of lab practicals. And she tells them that they can research anything, anything. And she specifically um, asks them to think about doing something from their lived worlds. And quite a few do. I, I go and attend her poster session. The project concludes in a poster session in the Nielsen every year. It's beautiful to see. Um, the students are working in groups. And there are multiple reasons for why this is an example of decolonization. But amongst that is the fact that it plays out entirely differently here. Um, quite often, if we take science to solve problems in Africa, it could again be seen as that quote that we had up right in the beginning of Elata saying that um, we, as the scientists, as the Westerners, are coming in to solve all the problems. In this case, that problem is overcome in that the students themselves identify the issues, so they already come with the correct social gaze. If a student decides, as one did one year, or a group did, to research the sheep on her own sheep farm, she brings that, she comes in with that social gaze. She is legitimate as a knower to bring that into the classroom. And she has the trained gaze that she has acquired over almost three years of studying science at Stellenbosch University. So that changes how that project is perceived because it's not Karen Jacobs going in there and solving the problem for someone, nor is it Karen Jacobs drawing the indigenous knowledge from someone in the field and and making a dance to the tune of science. This is a student who comes with an entirely different gaze into this picture, or then a group of students. Okay, so I want to look at, before I get to that, just two more examples from Stellenbosch University Science and why some of these might be perceived different, in different ways. One comes from monology. Here, science are asked to research the idea of the DOP system, the system in which farm workers were paid with wine at the end of a working day, and to, write, to come up with an opinion or write something about it. This sits in the exotic quadrant, if you look at it from the perspective of science, because it's not science content, and it's not for advancing science. And now we can see why students in science, and even other lecturers in science, might frown upon it, even though it's a good idea, sitting in a science curriculum. An alternative to that, actually coming from conservation ecology, I think, this lecturer asked students on day one of the class to draw a timeline of conservation in Africa or South Africa on the ground. So they draw that. Then she corrects that timeline because quite often she said what she finds, um, interestingly, is that the timeline starts at 1652, always. No conservation prior to that. No ecological issues prior to 1652. So she speaks to them a little bit. They correct the timeline. And in correcting the timeline, she corrects their historical perspective of Africa. And then she goes from that to correcting their understanding of the discipline's history. So what we see her doing is she's traveling three quadrants in the process. There's no science for the purpose of science really there, but there is something else, history for the purpose of science. Then there's something that is neither science for a purpose that is not science. And through that, she travels to science for the purpose of something else, in this case, correcting, correcting history. And of course, there's science in there as well. But we can see that this one might go down a little better because it feels more sciencey already than the first example that I shared. All right. So returning to Science Must Fall, just one slide on that. The Science Must Fall video clip asks for knowledge that's produced by us, that speaks to us, and that is able to accommodate knowledge from our perspective. So this is, if you look from the perspective of science, this is exotic quadrant. This is not science for a purpose that is not science. And while science is about, and they are, this is from, um, or they, in that conversation, speak about science as Western ideas, West, and we know Western content and ways of doing applied by Westerners to further the Western agenda of advancing science. I've just rewritten science as we know it in the words of the Science Must Fall video clip. So what we see here, I've written it in their words, but from the perspective of science at the bottom, what, oopsie, what we see here is another code clash. These two are sitting in opposing quadrants, 
different underlying structuring principles taking place here. So putting emphasis on different things altogether. Then lastly, the specialized, uh, this is the work of Chris and Simon Winberg. They spoke to multiple engineers, to engineering educators, um, and to students. And they came up with three proposed curricula for um, as, as possible decolonization <coughs> curricula for engineering. The first one was a specialized curriculum based on science content selected for its specific value in solving African needs. The second one, that's a curriculum that focused strongly on science and technology in society content, so sociology of science type of content, to help students better understand the roots um, of science, the history of science, and then a curriculum based on science content, but including some um, of STS and some specific con the content specific to the needs of Africa. And they then took these free curricula back to students and back to, back to the um, educators and asked them which one of them they would prefer. And I'm going to go through it quickly. So curriculum two was the curriculum in which science and technology content, if I go back up for a moment, what, or science and technology and society content was bring in to help students understand the history of science. So this curriculum, we could say, is a curri curriculum in which the purpose is more towards history and correcting than it is engineering or science. It's sitting in the Trojan quadrant. I can tell you that's not the one that was selected. Then we have curriculum three, which is the one in which we bring in examples to help people solve specific African problems. So it's got a bit of STS in it, lots of science in it, and examples from Africa in it. This was the selected curriculum in the end. And then curriculum two, or curriculum one at least, is a, a curriculum with the aim of a social justice agenda. Right. And here again, we can explain why curriculum three is selected by all these participants, because it's the one that still keeps most of science intact. Right. It's not one that is doing something else, is perceived as doing something else for another purpose. It is still science. And it's still for the purpose of advancing science, but it has additional purposes. It probably travels the quadrants a little better than any of the other curricula. All right, so where does this take us? In an opinion piece in the conversation again, Karen Brody says, quotes Jonathan Janssen from his book, who says that, uh, suggests that transforming university campuses into deracialized spaces, and she wrote this in the context, of decolonization requires attention to both the academic and the human project. I take the human project to mean st how students see themselves and I presume how we see them as well. And this is what I want to end this with. If we then look at where to from here, how to take a way forward. The difficulty with science is that we cannot just go in and say let's throw out all the knowledge of science and rebuild it. Not just because it took 100 years of building but because that is what science holds dear. That is the organizing principles in science is about the knowledge and building the knowledge. Um, so, but in that process, possibly if I read what a lot of people are saying about decolonization, words like empathy is coming up. And we've just seen the human project there. Possibly where science has, by nature of what it is, has failed in its teaching is to bring in the human project. And um, that's understandable since science sits completely in the knowledge quadrant as we have shown before. So what can we do and where does this lead us? I think the first thing that this data, the research show us, is why we have a breakdown in conversation about decolonization between people coming from social sciences calling for decolonization and people in science responding to that. The second thing it is showing us is that we cannot take the principles for decolonization from social sciences and humanities as they are and just apply them to science because the structures underpinning these fields are different. And the third thing it shows us is that not everything that looks like decolonization might be perceived as decolonization. So that still doesn't tell us what to do and how to move forward, does it? Tell us what we can look at and how we can understand things. And that unfortunately is where I have to leave you. I think we have to... I think we have to collectively think about how we're moving forward. And I can put in just a tiny spoiler that Max and I met yesterday, and we believe we have a theory, a model, that might help us move forward, but we haven't worked with it at all. What I can say about it is why it excites me. I don't know why it excites her. might be multiple reasons, but why it excites me. It's the kind of model that will allow us to look at the human project in science without eroding that which we hold dear in science, which is the knowledge basis. So keeping that intact, but looking at how we, 
how we bring in the human project and the other elements of learning and understanding that is necessary for students. Unfortunately, that's as much as I can say at this point in time about that. But I think I have said enough to stop at this point in time. So thank you. This really, for me, last year and again this year, has been a journey inward. Um, it is not just a journey of looking at data. It's very nice to stand behind data. I think what legitimation code theory does for us as scientists is it removes a little bit of the emotion from this conversation and from this project, but it does help us to look inward as well, or it did help me to look inward as well. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Um, well, I think you, you left us at a very interesting point, and that's what do you think? Yeah. Any comments? <laughs> Welcome. I'll bring the mic to you. Any comments? Any thoughts? There we go. Hi, Andy. Sorry. Michael. I've been grappling with this decolonization concept as well. And listening to you, there's only one question I have is really when you portray science, it seems to be almost like a very static thing that sits in that corner and social on that side. When I view science, but I, I come from the applied sciences, mm -hmm. I look at science as I do science, I have theories but I have a product, or I produce something, whether it's a car, a rocket, a TV, name it, and, and what I produce from the sciences also determines, um, at least in part, to what happens to the social interaction. And that's where I don't know where the decolonization fits in, because if I remove that, I might take away that produce, and therefore that no longer exists for the, for the society. And I don't know where that um, the kind of links together, or whether one can actually say we only have science with theories. Uh, shouldn't we say we have science that we have to produce something for mankind or for... And I know, yes, a lot of it is a Western um, nice culture, but even in Africa, a lot of that is used by the social uh, science or the living mm. or everyday living. So I just wanted to just kind of see what you thought about that. <laughs> <laughs> if that makes sense. Okay, so maybe just the first point first, portraying it as something static sitting in one quadrant, um, that's a fault on my side. I think the idea is just to portray what to try and find the simplest possible way of portraying what holds in science. What do we count as knowledge in science? Who can make that knowledge? And why are certain things in our curricula and other things not? So that's the first point. It's not static and it can move. I did say it's a very broad strokes application. So immediately applied sciences would sit in a slightly different space to, for instance, mathematics and especially physics. Um, so if we go into our pure sciences classrooms, mathematics, physics, even chemistry, which I'm more familiar with, in our pure sciences labs, when I was there many years ago, a lot of the conversation was about um, whether we can do blue skies research. You know, how, how okay is it? And as a scientist, I kept feeling that a lot of the advances in society came from blue skies research, which had no application at that point in time. So that's sort of the, the picture of science I painted here, is that picture. But there are subcultures inside science where things play out slightly differently and I think what we need to do as a whole in science is to learn from experiences through applied science as well and where the social reactions with that or social relations are emphasized a little bit more. So what I should also say, otherwise um, I would not have been true to the conversations that Max and I often have, is science puts knowledge above knowers. It doesn't say it doesn't have knowers. It doesn't say knowers are not important. And it certainly does not say that it's value neutral. There are values in science, and there are social relations playing out in science. What we see when we look with a broad strokes view is just knowledge, because knowers are hidden a little deeper underneath that. And there's a new set of things playing out in that context. But thank you. Let's do a wrap also. Yeah. <laughs> You're not allowed to ask. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not actually going to ask a question. Good. I'm going to make a comment. Um, I, I'm Max Blackie, by the way. Um, so I think the reason that, that I was very interested in this project is because it, it gave us a way to, to take the decolonization conversation seriously, but understand what's at stake. So understand what, what, the, what the call is for, and to understand what's at stake for us as scientists so we don't sell our souls to make people happy. Like, we, we, we've, we've, but we want to take the conversation seriously. So that's... 
You see why she's my co-author. <laughs> <laughs> or I'm her co-author. <laughs> I just, no, I don't have a question either, because I just want to say something. Um, I want to thank you for a very um, enlightening talk, because I've sat in a number of these decolonizing um, fora and discussions. And I think as a scientist, this is the first time that I actually feel it's made some sense to me without me getting frustrated and thinking, oh no, I, I don't want to hear this word ever again spoken in my... It, and I think you've really done a very uh, sort of a subject... You looked at it very... You know, I mean, objectively, listen to me, objectively, and it's really... <laughs> it's, it's, it's given me a, a new sort of... I don't want to say... It's given me sort of hope that maybe we can actually tackle this as scientists and... I just want to say, well done. Yeah, Very nice job. Yeah, Very nice you. job. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a, that's a beautiful conclusion, giving us ways to think about it instead of opposing views and then feeling rejected on the one end. And uh, yeah, thank you. Um, that was lovely. Any final comments there at the back? Let's, let's say one or two more comments, and then we can adjourn. Hi. Thank, thank you for the very beautiful talk indeed um, so I don't know if what I'm going to say is I do not know if what I'm going to say is useful or not uh, my impression is that the problem that is being identified by the term decolonization is not the that there is something wrong with the content that we teach but that there is something wrong how we teach mm -hmm. this content the rhythm of life which a student needs to have in order to acquire the content with the pace that we expect this to be acquired and with the within the structure of all the exams and the tests and so on is very colonial. That, that is my impression. The, what is colonial <coughs> is the rhythm of how we uh, uh, pass this knowledge and not the, not the mm. content of the knowledge itself. Yeah. I'm hoping that that is what Max and I will be able to prove as well. Um, at this point in time, we share the, the opinion, but I think we need empirical data. Or we need some, we need a bit, a, a stronger argument, either rooted in philosophy or in data, to make that same claim. But the more and more I look at this work, it's the same position I'm coming to. For now. I hope the right to change. Melanie, let's, you can have the last work, and then I just want to say thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you very much. That was very useful. Um, I'm left with a, with a thought that perhaps we are all challenged by um, reflecting very deeply on the, the tension between disciplines where there's a knower focus and the ones where there's a knowledge kind of focus and valuing. And perhaps it's time that we all, not just in sciences, but in all the disciplines and in higher education as a whole, that we, we consider how we can bring the human being back into our knowledge mm. project, which usually is what we focus on yes. in, in higher education. Mm. And I think it goes much broader, but what you've presented we can draw on in a, in a much broader context. And if we want to talk about decolonizing, transforming, social justice, and all of the above, it really is about who is that human being who knows? Who is that human being who produces something, builds yes. something, takes that knowledge further into the field of reproduction? So that's, that's just, you know, I just wanted to put what you're saying in a broader context because I think it's relevant beyond mm. sciences, natural sciences, mm. pure sciences. Thank you very much. It was great. Thank you. And I think we all echo that. Thank you for um, of, um, leading us into these thought processes. Colleagues, um, thanks for being here. And um, as you go, continue with your academic project. Remember, we are actually busy with the human project.
right here in Africa. <laughs> and enjoy what you're doing. Thanks so much. Thank you.